Welcome to Online Worship with First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Valparaiso, Indiana. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. To prepare for worship, please stop this video recording, go get something to eat and drink to bring back to your worship space for communion elements, and if you have a candle at home, please bring that to your worship space also. And now, as our worship servant group member, Carol Kosnicki, lights our worship candle, this would be the time for you to light your candle in your worship space at home. May each of us be aware that the light of Christ is with us always, bringing light into dark spaces. And now Elder Sue Ann Benham will call us to worship. Brothers and sisters, everything God made is good and the great family of humanity is the most precious of all. Come, let us worship our Creator God. We may feel alone and forgotten, yet we are more valuable than the birds of the air, and not one of them falls but that the Lord knows and cares. Come, let us worship our loving God. We may feel ineffective before the problems of our time, but the Spirit empowers us to love our neighbor and to help God's kingdom be fully realized on earth as it is in heaven. Come, let us worship our challenging God. Finally, though we tremble before the power of sin and death, we know both were defeated by divine love on the cross. Come, let us worship our saving God. Amen. Amen. Now, please join in singing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
Before we speak to God in prayer, would you join me in a moment of silence as we strive to listen to God? Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you today for all our earthly fathers, dads, uncles, brothers, grandfathers, and others who provide love, strength, and encouragement. We remember fathers who have passed but are with us in our hearts and memories. We are thankful we can meet again as family, our church family. While it has been and still is different and sometimes difficult, we remember your promises to us. When we walk with you in the light of your word, you will always be with us. Even though you know our thoughts, our highs and our lows, before we whisper them to you, speaking to you in prayer is sweet and comforting and reassuring. You want to hear our prayers and we thank you. We pray for our nation and the world in a turbulent time. We ask for peace, guidance, and an abundance of love for one another. Help us to look beyond color, Father, to one day not see white, black, yellow, or red, to not see blue eyes, brown, hazel, or green, to not see short, tall, heavy or thin, to not see clear skin or scars, but to love each human being as you have. Help us, please help us, to give the job of judging to you, Father. We are doing a terrible job of it, aren't we? We pray for our leaders, our policemen and women, all first responders, doctors and nurses, those working for cures, and those caring for the infirm. Bless them. Bless those with loving hearts, those that often go unnoticed but are your disciples doing good every day. We thank you today, Father, that you draw us to yourself despite our sins and failures. Help us not draw away from you when we make mistakes. Instead, help us choose to come to you in faith, believing that you love us and want to help us. We are richly blessed. Hear us now as we pray that prayer your son taught his disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sometimes his eyes were gentle and filled with laughter, and sometimes they cried. Sometimes there was a fire of holy anger in Jesus' eyes. The eyes that saw hope in the hopeless that saw through the fall to the need are 
the same eyes that look down from heaven into the deepest part of you and me. And his eyes are always upon us. His eyes never close in sleep. After the disciples, now called apostles, were fired up by the Holy Spirit during Pentecost, they began teaching, preaching, and healing in Jerusalem. Many people came to hear them, and quite a few came to be healed. Such actions did not sit at all well with the authorities who had engineered the crucifixion, and this is what happened next according to Acts chapter 5 verses 17 through 32. The high priest and his allies, the Sadducees, were overcome with jealousy. They seized the apostles and made a public show of putting them in prison. But an angel from the Lord opened the prison doors during the night and let them out. The angel told them, 
go take your place in the temple and tell the people everything about this new life. Early in the morning, they went into the temple as they had been told and began to teach. When the high priest and his colleagues gathered, they convened the Jerusalem Council, that is, the full assembly of Israel's elders. They sent word to the prison to have the apostles brought before them. However, the guards didn't find them in the prison. They returned and reported, We found the prison locked and well secured with guards standing at the doors. But when we opened the doors, we found no one inside. When they received this news, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were baffled and wondered what might be happening. Just then, someone arrived and announced, Look, the people you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain left with his guards and brought the apostles back. They didn't use force because they were afraid the people would stone them. The apostles were brought before the council where the high priest confronted them. In no uncertain terms, we demanded that you not teach in this name and look at you. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to hold us responsible for this man's death. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than humans. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God has exalted Jesus to his right side as leader and savior so that he could enable Israel to change its heart and life and to find forgiveness for sins. We are witnesses of such things, as is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. May God bless to our hearing and understanding this reading from the Holy Word. Amen. Amen. Well, hello friends. Thanks for joining us. Tell me something. Do you remember back in 2014 when a lot of us took the ice bucket challenge? It was kind of fun, but it was also a lot more fun to help somebody else take the challenge. It was silly, really, but it raised $115 million to fight the neurodegenerative disease known as ALS. These days, our challenges are much less fun. Trying to love our neighbor with distance and masks. Trying to balance justice for black lives with justice for blue lives. And, just in case we're starting to feel a little bit comfortable, there's always climate change to worry about. But it helps a little to know that we're not the first to live in challenging times. Around 35 AD, that's certainly how the people of Jerusalem would have described their situation. They would tell us that CNN, the Canaanite news network, is saying something is definitely afoot. And Fox News, owned by King Herod, whose nickname was The Fox, reports that trouble is brewing. Security forces are skittish. The world has been shaken, nature has turned into the enemy and made normal life a thing of the past by allowing a crucified rabble-rouser to escape the tomb. The authorities, hoping to keep public order, called a state of emergency. The troublemakers, who were attempting to capitalize on this weirdness, were rounded up and brought to court to account for themselves because the resurrection commotion needed to be quelled. In the Acts of the Apostles, the resurrection is depicted as a veritable explosion that propels Jesus' once disheartened followers into confrontations with the authorities. The bigwigs are not amused and toss them into jail, but an angel frees them from prison and then tells them, go take your place in the temple and tell the people everything about this new life. 
And so the apostles, sure enough, go right back to the temple at daybreak, the same time of day that Jesus rose from the tomb. And they continue telling people about his life, death, and resurrection. For their troubles, they are rounded up again and told, In no uncertain terms, we demanded that you not teach in this name. But look at you. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Peter and the apostles defiantly answer, We must obey God rather than humans. Peter informs the authorities that they intend to keep telling people about Easter, keep healing the poor without a license, keep stirring up trouble in the ghetto no matter what the police say, and, quote, when the council members heard this, they became furious and wanted to kill the apostles. Now, if you and I are a bit surprised by how much rage the authorities feel, then I bet you've never been an authority. You never had to bear the responsibility of power. And one of the most important of those responsibilities is to provide for public order, safety, security. People in power are supposed to keep things running smoothly and provide the rest of us with security from external threats. In the current run-up to the presidential election, both candidates are telling us they know how to keep us safe and the other guy is going to get us killed. Long ago, Thomas Hobbes said this world is such a poor, brutish, and sorry place that we must exchange some of our freedoms for the power of the state to rule and protect us. And sure enough, governments around the world occasionally curtail freedoms, and they always justify it as necessary to provide order. Before we get indignant about that, consider this. Even libertarians, the people who want to deregulate everything, are probably glad that we have laws to keep people from making or dispensing drugs, practicing medicine, or doing surgery just because they want to. We want caregivers who are credentialed, educated, and approved by somebody with the appropriate knowledge. After all, if the kid who delivers my papers throws it on the roof more often than on the porch, then I can just cancel my delivery. But if the doctor I go to for appendicitis accidentally removes my spleen, I've got trouble. That's one of the problems the authorities had when Peter and the other apostles performed miraculous signs and wonders. We can't have un- learned, ordinary people running around healing, proclaiming a power let loose in the world that's greater than that of any government. Charlatans were a dime a dozen back then, and people needed to be protected from them. And there's another aspect to all of this that I understand, and that understanding stems from the fact that I have great respect for the Regional Commission on Ministries that oversees the formal ordination of people in my denomination. Among the various hoops they make wannabe ministers jump through, candidates have to be involved in a program of theological and ecclesiological study, and they must have a sponsoring education, a congregation rather, who knows them well. In other words, just feeling called to the ministry is not enough. Now, it's not a perfect system. I mean, I squeaked through, but it works pretty well. After all, it's fine to... Uh, think that you're called by God to be clergy, but that call needs to be vetted and examined and all like that before the person is officially credentialed. Plus, those credentials should be periodically updated because people change. As a very famous example, Jim Jones began his clerical career as an amazing minister to poor people, and he lost his ministerial standing because he started to go just plain nuts. Losing his certification didn't keep him from eventually doing something truly horrible, but I'm at least glad he was no longer a minister in good standing. Society needs various professions to have standards and qualifications, and we need authorities who are responsible for making sure that candidates are qualified and meet those standards trouble is, 
That's exactly the resurrection-denying mentality that's been attacked in our reading from Acts chapter 5. It portrays the governing authorities, the ecclesiastical high mucky mucks, as idiots, or worse. The bigwigs in the front office think they're in charge, and they truly believe, I think, that they are enforcing God's will by trying to put an end to all this post-Easter resurrection nonsense. But Luke, the author of Acts, asserts through his stories that there is indeed a power let loose in the world, a divine love that cannot be contained or accredited or channeled by the powers that be. Those who think they are in control are shown to be powerless. And people on the bottom uneducated and inexperienced people like Peter and the other apostles, those folks are making the authorities look like the emperor with no clothes. After a long, grueling meeting of the Regional Commission on Ministry, in which members had laboriously accepted and rejected uh, this and that candidate for ordination, in the midst of them feeling good about themselves, I've been told that one of the younger members asked, Say, does anybody else here worry that with all this examining and vetting, we're in danger of producing clones of ourselves? Robbing the church of risk-taking creative leaders who are, are our congregations will need if they are to have a future? The man who told me that story said the question kind of hung in the air for a while, and it hurt. It hurt. And the fact that it hurt made him wonder if he wasn't closer than he wanted to be to that long-ago Jerusalem power elite who tried to stop Peter and the apostles. It also helped him realize that the lowly and dispossessed, some of the members of the first fledgling congregations to whom this story was scripture, would have heard about political tables being turned upside down and considered it nothing less than a gospel miracle. It makes me wonder, whose side would I have been on? Would I have been with the apostles, performing loving acts among the marginalized and dispossessed, audaciously standing up to the authorities, refusing to pipe down and be quiet? Or would I have been sitting in my office, telling these naive do-gooders, to be careful what they say, and to give authorities at least the benefit of the doubt. It is sadly easy to think of historical examples of ways in which the church has allied itself with the forces of death rather than the risk of life after Easter. I'm thinking of the Inquisition and the Salem witchcraft trial. Or the fact that almost every unit in Hitler's army and chapter in the Ku Klux Klan had their own chaplain. Now happily, those things have faded away. And you might say they died due to their various hatreds, racial prejudice, and practice of injustice. There would be a lot of truth in that. But I think it's even more accurate to say they died due to a lack of faith in the truth of Easter. The truth that Jesus is a force for love, a force that's more powerful even than death. And that force will keep moving forward until everybody, even the least of us, maybe especially the least of us, experiences peace and justice and the embrace of God's love. Back in the day, Peter stood on one side before the authorities of his time, authorities who could not figure out a way to keep him locked up and quiet, powerful folks who had nothing but contempt for Peter's lack of education and naivete. Those authorities were nervously attempting to keep a lid on commotion and keep things safe for the beloved status quo. As for Peter and the others on his side, they may have sympathized with the authorities at least a little bit. We know 
Peter still has a lot of growing to do when it comes to accepting just how big Jesus wants this family to be. But they have a mandate from God. And that mandate does not include keeping the comfortable comfortable. Doesn't include not rocking the boat. Now you and I, well, we're about as far from the most recent Easter as they were from the first one. The question before us is, which side are we on? Hmm. Well, allow me to let that question hang in the air for a while as we prepare for offering and communion by singing Marching to Zion. Normally, we'd share our offering at this time, but as we've been saying, nothing is normal these days. However, let me encourage you to continue offering prayer, prayers for each other, for our church, and for all the nation and the whole world. And if you would like to give a more traditional offering, it will be very much appreciated. You can mail a check to 1507 Glendale Boulevard in Valparaiso, Indiana, 46383, or go to the Donate tab at the bottom of our webpage, fccvalpo.org. Would you pray with me? 
God, whatever donations are made, please bless the gift and the giver that both might work faithfully for the glory of your kingdom. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, as we prepare to receive your sacred meal in Holy Communion, prepare our minds and hearts to receive you. We come with so much going on within us that is unsettling. Help us set aside whatever is troubling us for these few minutes and focus our attention on you, Lord. We are so grateful you sacrificed yourself for each of us, whether we believe in you or not. You continue to love us, whether we return that love or not. Even if we don't understand that kind of love, help us accept it and take it in, just as we take in this special meal. Bless this bit to eat and this sip to drink. May these elements fill us and transform us that we might become more like you. Amen. And at this time in the service, we pause and remember when Christ met with his disciples for that last meal together before his arrest and crucifixion. That during the meal, our Lord took bread and he blessed it and broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my body broken for you, take and eat. And after the meal, our Lord took a cup of wine and he passed it among them as saying, take and drink. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. It is the blood of a new covenant with God. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. Our Lord's meal is open to all. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, receive this blessing from the words of St. Paul to the early church in Corinth. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Yeah.
Thank you for worshiping with us today. We are open now for public worship on Sundays, outdoors at 7.30 and then indoors at 9.30. At both services, we are asking everyone to please wear a mask and practice social distancing. A blessing to share with the church family comes from Alan Hamilton. He is a great grandpa. His granddaughter Jasmine gave birth to a baby boy. So congratulations, Alan and Jasmine. Friends, we hope you are well. You are loved and missed. God bless.